Ono. I have the privilege of chairing uh, this uh, session. And I should like to uh, start by uh, introducing Dr. Richard Gunderman from Indiana University. Uh, so hello, fellow compatriot from the state of Indiana. And he's going to uh, talk to us about uh, John Locke, uh, who is uh, known as one of the most influential physicians to have ever lived. And Richard, please take it away. We very much look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say, and I'm delighted to be with you. And uh, I think a lot of people know John Locke as a very important empiricist philosopher, uh, certainly as a very important political philosopher. Uh, a lot of people don't know that he was a physician. And I think there's a terrific case to be made that his approach to uh, empiricist and political philosophy was profoundly shaped by the pra practice of medicine so that um, he was in fact drawing on medicine in developing many of his theories of human knowledge, uh, what we might call human rights and appropriate limitations on uh, government infringement on those rights. So that being said, uh, let's dive in. So here's a portrait of John Locke. Uh, many of us in medicine get the chance to treat individual patients, and I suppose over the course of our careers may have the chance to enhance the health of hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people over a career. Uh, others focus on public health and may make a difference in the lives of thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of people, as in the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, John Locke was somebody who, who influenced the course of history on planet Earth with his, with his theories, as we'll see. And he lived, of course, uh, largely in the 17th century. This, of course, is a depiction of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But Locke is remembered today as one of the deepest thinkers of the Enlightenment, uh, really a founder, if not the founder, of economic and political liberalism, uh, certainly a leading light of uh, the philosophical school of empiricism, which says that what we know, we know by virtue of experience and not through innate ideas. He's a major contributor to our thinking about epistemology, that is how we know and what we can know. And finally, might be the single most influential thinker on the founders of our system of government, including um, uh, I don't know, maybe Baron Montesquieu should be in that in that field too. But I think you could argue Locke is the most single uh, influential individual. And we owe, we owe to Locke a lot of our uh, major concepts, uh, not only in political philosophy, but uh, in our lives today. He was a staunch defender of what we would call freedom or liberty. He really developed the theory of natural rights to an extraordinary degree, uh, developed a model of representative government so that the government exists to serve the people and not the people to serve the government or our governors, uh, believed deeply in the right of revolution. That is, if a government starts to infringe on those rights, it can be replaced. And as I've already indicated, I think for those reasons, he is perhaps the most influential certainly one of the most influential physicians who ever lived. And just to say a little bit more about the practice of medicine, he did in fact practice medicine at least intermittently most of his adult life. And I think his uh, encounters with patients profoundly shaped his views on matters such as human nature, what is a human being, what can and can't a human being do, uh, the limits of human knowledge, which he took very, very seriously, uh, our ability to know what's best for others. Do you know what's best for me? Can I know what's best for you? And finally, the boundaries of liberty and responsibility. So let's say just a little bit about Locke's life. These are, of course, all, all uh, portraits up to this point of John Locke. He was born in Somerset, England in the 17th century. Both of his parents were Puritans. There's a lot more that could be said about that, but for the moment, let's just say that that meant he grew up in a very non-conformist household. He was accustomed to the idea that his ideas didn't necessarily comport with those of most of the people around him. 
He went to Westminster School in London on a scholarship, later attended Oxford University. Like many people who attended Oxford, he didn't think very highly of the education he received there, but he did get a bachelor's and a master's degree. Perhaps even more important, he had a chance to work with Robert Boyle. Many of us remember Boyle's work on the relationship between the pressure and temperature and volume of gases. And he also worked with one of the great early microscopists and true polymaths, namely Robert Hooke, who we of course remember for among other things, coining the term cell. Uh, we all know we're made of about 50 trillion cells, each of us adult human beings. Robert Hooke was the first person to recognize this fundamental unit of biological structure and function, the cell. So anyway, uh, Locke uh, studied uh, under the uh, the shadow of some very important figures in the history of modern science. Uh, while he was at Oxford, he met the Earl of Shaftesbury, a very important political figure in 17th century England, and uh, then became a member of his household in London, so very attached to the Earl of Shaftesbury. And while he was in London, he worked with Thomas Sydenham, uh, often called the English Hippocrates, really one of the greatest empiricists in the history of medicine, somebody who thought you had to observe the patient. That's where knowledge to, was to be found, not, uh, not in medical theories. And some, some would suggest that Locke, in fact, saved the life of the Earl of Shaftesbury. He didn't perform the procedure, but it was under his direction that what we think was an abscess in uh, the Earl's uh, liver uh, was drained under Locke's direction. So he may have saved the life of a very important political figure. So just a little bit more about Locke's life. Eventually, Shaftesbury becomes the Lord Chancellor, obviously a very, very high post in British government. Uh, he leaves uh, England at least twice, uh, perhaps to save his skin, but certainly under very difficult political circumstances. The second time after the Rye House plot, uh, an, a, a plot uh, likely to assassinate King Charles II, uh, Locke doesn't appear to have any direct role in that, but people he was associated with did, so he fled to the Netherlands. And then when he came back in the 1690s, he published four really remarkable works to which we're now turned. We talk about Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, uh, those great papers he published on topics like special relativity and Brownian motion. Well, uh, Locke had his own uh, Annus Mirabilis with publishing these four great works. And these are, of course, the essay on human understanding, again, perhaps the most important uh, tract in the history of philosophical empiricism, his letter on toleration. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wanted to be remembered as the author of the Virginia Statute on Toleration, very much inspired by Locke. And then Locke also published the first and second treatises of government. So let's go through each of those uh, in brief, obviously skimming over far more than we can delve into, but uh, a little bit about Locke's view of human understanding, which is among other things that at birth, we are uh, tabula rasa, uh, basically a blank tablet, a blank slate. We know nothing at birth. And everything we know now, or at least think we know now, is not from any kind of innate knowledge, but comes from our experience. So from Locke's point of view, there are no innate ideas. Uh, the idea that you could prove the existence of God, let's say, on some uh, ontological ground, for example, wouldn't make sense. And from Locke's point of view, even mathematical truths are, are uh, come to us by way of experience, not innate knowledge. And perhaps even more important in the essay concerning understanding, Locke thinks our capacity to know is quite limited. You know, it's a question for each of us. What do you think is the human capacity to know? And uh, in what ways is uh, that capacity limited? So I hope it's clear from what I've said that Locke was a sharp opponent of uh, what we might call human intellectual pride. He had real doubts about the human capacity to know. And uh, on that basis, 
he thought we shouldn't uh, meddle very much in the affairs of others. For example, uh, he thought that as a physician, not just John Locke, but Thomas Sydenham or Hippocrates himself, if he ever existed, uh, as physicians, these individuals could never see all there was to see. We might treat 100 patients, 1,000 patients, 10,000 patients, but there's always far more than we haven't seen than we've been able to see over the course of our own careers. He also thought there could be no permanent theory of medicine because uh, knowledge is going to be revised as people make new observations, new discoveries. And finally, Locke thought that the human organism was simply too complex uh, for any permanent theory, uh, any final theory of medicine ever to arise. As I said before, we're each composed of at least 50 trillion cells. Uh, I don't think any one of us would be adequately equipped to sit down at the control seat of even one of those 50 trillion cells, let alone uh, 100, 1,000, a million, and so forth. So this is from Locke's essay of, on human understanding. There's not so contemptible a plant or animal that does not confound the most enlarged understanding. So even the most basic life forms are beyond our capacity to fully understand. The workmanship of the all-wise and powerful God in the great fabric of the universe and every part thereof farther exceeds the capacity and comprehension of the most inquisitive and, and intelligent man than the best contrivance of the most ingenious man does the conceptions of the most ignorant rational creatures. So in brief, uh, if there is a God, God's uh, understanding of things exceeds ours by a much greater margin than that of the wisest human being exceeds that of the most ignorant human being. So from Locke's point of view, our understanding is always partial and provisional. That doesn't mean some people don't understand things better than others, but nobody understands everything. So you can see Locke lines up somewhat with uh, the venerable, venerable tradition of skepticism. Michel de Montaigne, for example, uh, he prizes the observable over the theoretical. What matters is what actually happens, what we can actually see, not what our theories would predict. And uh, above all, he's he's fairly pragmatic at a time when pragmatism, you know, with William James and Charles Saunders Peirce doesn't mean what we mean today. But uh, he's a pragmatist. The big question is, does the patient get better? If the answer is no, we need to change what we're doing. And perhaps most important of all, and I, I love this for my own practice of medicine, and I hope you do too if you're in healthcare, the particular patient before us is always the most real and significant thing we need to attend to. That's where our really real responsibility and loyalty should lie. So that's all I want to say about the essay on human understanding, although, of course, there's a great deal more to be said. Let's move on to Locke's uh, second important treatise from the early 1690s, namely his letter on toleration, in which he expresses particularly for his age, a time of fierce religious wars in Europe, uh, fierce uh, conflicts between Protestants and Catholics in, in England, Locke expresses a remarkable openness to religious diversity, uh, basically in part because he thinks states, governments, should not be concerned with the spiritual interests of their subjects. Uh, the spiritual dimension of, of human life is something governments shouldn't presume to meddle in. And, and on that basis, you can imagine he's an early proponent of what we've come to call in the United States, the separation of church and state. They have their own, uh, their own magisteria, which shouldn't uh, conflict with one another. And, and from Locke's point of view, no person or no statesman, no government official can know the one true religion. That relates to his, his skepticism, his empirical conception of knowledge. So Locke would say, uh, uh, perhaps you're a person of faith, as you behold people of, of other faiths, that none of us should ever cut ourselves off from learning. Every conversation offers the opportunity for insight, 
And uh, it's very helpful to be able to consider managed religious from uh, multiple different vantage points. So Locke thought we should always be open to considering new possibilities. And he really put his faith, so to speak, not in unassailable dogmas, uh, creeds, so to speak, but in the quest for new knowledge. So for Locke, what matters most is not certainty, because that's impossible. Anybody who claims to be certain uh, is, is fooling uh, themselves at the very least. And uh, Locke regarded, I think, the practice of medicine, a career in medicine, as a kind of unfolding adventure. Uh, just as we can't know with certainty, uh, we can always discover new things that may cause us to revise our our. Uh, our opinions, our hypotheses, and very important for Locke, no one has a God's eye point of view. Any human being that pretends to such certainty, uh, such omniscience, is again a victim of his or her own self-deception. So here's Locke from the letter on toleration. He that in physic, that of course for our purposes means medicine, he that in medicine shall lay down fundamental maxims and from thence drawing consequence and raising dispute shall reduce it into the regular form of a science, has indeed done something to enlarge the art of talking and perhaps laid a foundation for endless disputes. But if he hopes to bring men by such a system to the knowledge of the infirmities of men's bodies, he is much mistaken. So our maxims, our theories uh, must always remain subordinate to what we actually observe. And people who are too so attached to their theories that they would presume uh, to engage a kind of hegemony uh, against others are in fact uh, doing a great deal of damage. So from Locke's point of view, you know, we hear, for example, about Occam's razor. Wouldn't it be nice if we could explain all the patient's complaints in terms of a single disease it's also true to say that patients can have as many diseases as they want. Uh, the, the, the human mind is an imperfect instrument. Reality always exceeds our grasp. And uh, empirical approaches, not only to knowing in general and governing in particular, but also in the practice of medicine, empirical approaches are always to be preferred. So from Locke's point of view, if we adopt a tolerant perspective, we don't rule out conversing with someone because we disagree with them. We leave the door open to advancing our own knowledge. Uh, it's imperative from his point of view that we avoid dogmatism and censorship, uh, that we engage in a lively interchange of ideas because that's what's most likely to produce uh, new discoveries and from Locke's point of view, we should organize our professional lives to promote it. So you might reflect on your life, your career, uh, to what degree does lively interchange, uh, maybe even debate, but at the very least exchange of alternative points of view constitute a regular feature of it. From Locke's point of view, we're likely to be at our best if the answer is uh, that we engage in that kind of lively interchange with people who see things differently on a regular basis. So uh, that that's Locke's comments from the letter on toleration. Again, very important in helping to shape the First Amendment to the U.S. Uh, Constitution. And uh, uh, I should say, yeah, the First Amendment. Uh, so now we turn to Locke's first treatise on government, which I'm, I'm afraid isn't read very often, but is basically an argument against oppression. He was basically attacking a book by another political theorist, Robert Filmer. The title of that book was Patriarcha, uh, I guess, rule by fathers, so to speak, or fatherly rule. And uh, in that work, Patriarcha, Filmer argues that uh, monarchy is the most natural and appropriate form of human government. And the best form of monarchy is a hereditary an absolute one. So in a perfect society from Filmer's point of view, uh, 
rulership would be passed from one generation to an, the next in a single family, a single bloodline, and each individual who held power in that bloodline would have absolute power. That this is, in fact, the way Filmer would say God intended it. And if you didn't believe that, you should turn to the Genesis account of uh, creation, uh, Adam, the Garden of Eden, and so forth. From Filmer's point of view, that's where patriarchy was established as the most natural and appropriate form of human government. Now, of course, Locke thinks otherwise. Uh, for one thing, Locke, as an exegete, somebody who reads the Bible carefully, he argues that Adam, the first uh, patriarch, the first hereditary king from Filmer's point of view, Adam did not have absolute authority. And then furthermore, there's the problem who today, meaning the 17th century or today in 2023, who could legitimately be called Adam's heir? Is, is any one of us any more related than anyone else to Adam? So uh, Locke basically stakes out a position against the oppression of ideas, uh, what we might call freedom of speech. This, of course, is a detail from Raphael's School of Athens. There on the left, you could see Socrates engaged in conversation with a few interlocutors, as he so often was, Locke believes such exchanges should be free. Our first loyalty should not be to a ruler or even to a system of government, but our first loyalty should be to the truth, at least to the extent we can apprehend it. And that should apply not just for uh, to us as citizens, but also to us as physicians and scientists. And for uh, Locke, apologies to interrupt, Richard. Uh, just giving you five minute notification, please. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we should be loyal to the truth, even at the expense of our own career prospects. So uh, Locke thinks that we can't really rely on hereditary monarchies and calls out the suppression of ideas. He thinks physicians should uh, be loyal first and, and always to the best interests of patients. To be a professional is to profess something. We need to know what it is we profess, and that should be what's best for our patients. So next comes the second treatise, uh, which is about freedom. Uh, Locke also adopts the so-called state of nature we find in Hobbes, but argues that uh, governments are instituted not for the benefit of rulers, but for the benefit of the people uh, they have responsibility for. And you can see examples of this in medicine today. For example, we're in the midst of a sea change from physician-owned medical practices here in the United States to the model of employed physicians, which can pressure physicians uh, to serve the interests of their employers, sometimes at the expense of the interest of patients. So, uh, you know, I feared this in my own medical system. We shouldn't refer patients outside our healthcare system. That represents leakage, among other things, the loss of revenue. So Locke doesn't directly write about medicine, but you can see in the tra treatise a notion that the good of patients should always come first. Patients don't exist to provide revenue. In fact, medicine exists to serve patients, and we need to be careful not to subordinate the interest of patients to economics. So from Locke's point of view, the end of law isn't to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. So anytime a physician employer would encourage a physician to do something that was good for business, but not for the patient, that's something the physician uh, is not only at liberty to question, but to some degree has a responsibility to do so. So just to remind you, Locke was a Whig, not a Tory. He didn't believe in the hereditary rights of kings or the absolute uh, rule of kings. He was from birth a nonconformist. He believed in the notion of rebellion. From Locke's point of view, any person we meet on the street has as much dignity and, and right to self-determination as any monarch. And the principal responsibility of physicians is always to care for each patient. So this is actually what was written on Locke's diploma, basically says uh, you're, you're granted the right to practice medicine 
so long as you do it for the interests of the people uh, you're caring for. So Locke thinks we need to serve a higher purpose, uh, among other things, that's the welfare of the patient. Uh, we should earn a, any respect we have for our knowledge, the lives we're leading, our moral integrity. Our purpose is to serve the community and uh, pursue the, the flourishing of our patients and communities. So that's the end of the presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard. That was impressive. Uh, we certainly Look forward to more of your work uh, uh, taking us through uh, Locke's uh, journey. And uh, I actually have a, a challenge for you, Richard. So uh, as you may know, 100 years, uh, well, 90 short years after Locke died, uh, Edward Jenner was uh, um, testing and pioneering vaccination. So I would uh, welcome your thoughts as to how Locke would have reacted to vaccination and also, in particular, how Locke would have reacted to today's uh, vaccine hesitancy. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I could tell you Benjamin Franklin, perhaps the most depressive American who ever lived, uh, regretted till his dying day that he didn't have his young son variolated, you know, we might say vaccinated against smallpox, and uh, his child died from smallpox. I think Locke's attitude would be, that uh, we should try to accumulate the best scientific and public health information we can about vaccination, but that ultimately the decision whether to vaccinate or not should be left to as great an extent as possible up to individuals and uh, that, that people shouldn't be required uh, to, to be vaccinated against their will. That's that's just a conjecture on my part. <laughs> it, it would be hypocrisy on my part to claim to know what Locke would say, but I think that's where his uh, very high respect for pro political liberty would tend. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, uh, I very much appreciated your response. Uh, unfortunately, because of time, we need to move on to the next speaker, but thanks again, Richard. And uh, now I welcome uh, Fabiana Buitor Carelli uh, from Princeton University, who's going to walk us through now a, a rather different part, uh, looking at the face behind the mask, medical patient portrayal as artistic truth. Uh, Fabiana, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin with a brief but uh, heartfelt greeting along with my sincere thanks to the organizer of this event, to Missouri Southern State University for hosting the significant series of events, and to all the speakers and attendees of Artful Medicine 2023. Before I dive into my presentation, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself since it's, this is my first time here. I'm Professor Fabiana Carelli. I come from Brazil. Uh, while uh, I've been working as a visiting research scholar um, here at Princeton University since March 2022, my primary role is a, a comparative literature professor at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, a position I've held since 2004. I'm also the co-founder and coordinator of Genom. Uh, GENAM stands for the University of Sao Paulo's uh, Group of Studies and Research in Literature, Narrative and Medicine. Uh, GENAM is a collaborative effort between the Faculty of Philosophy, Languages and Literatures and so Social Sciences uh, at USP and our School of Medicine. We established this group in uh, 2011. So long time ago, and over the years, we've explored the intersections of narrative medicine, medical humanities, phenomenology of health, and the arts. We've done so by engaging in teaching, advising, research, hosting events and discussions, and also publishing our findings. Our goal has been to develop a unique perspective on these fields, one that is rooted in the peripheral and, uh, if I may say, the colonial view of healthcare, physicians, patients, and ailments. 
I'll be happy to elaborate on these efforts later if you're interested, but for now, uh, I can tell you that this journey has led us led us to to develop a critical approach uh, to the fields of narrative medicine and medical humanities, viewing them through an artistic and creative lens. Uh, do you have a, uh, I have to, to share my screen. Is it okay if I share my screen from here? Go ahead. I think so, right? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we can see it now. All right. Great. To the switch. So the title of my presentation today, The Face Behind the Mask, and more specifically, the subtitle, Patient Medical Portrayal as Artistic Truth, Truth, sorry, indicate that I will not be discussing uh, the broad methodological implications and empirical possibilities of creative practices within the clinical setting and medical education, but instead I'll be focusing on a very specific uh, topic as I hope you will, you will see. To guide us through this discussion, I've organized my speech according to the following agenda. First, I'll intend to introduce a quick vis visual exercise to you called What Do You See? Next, drawing from my recent experience attending a class at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, I'll delve into the contentious discussion of whether portraying should be considered or not a form of betrayal. Next, uh, in the topic portrait of the patient as a sick one, uh, we'll try to briefly explore an actual patient case report by a renowned physician. Then we'll listen to some writer's testimonies on how they construct their characters. And finally, we'll tackle the important questions that lie at the heart of this talk, uh, which are what it means to face a patient and how we go about. Let's begin with our visual exercise. Uh, some of you might already be familiar with this artwork, while others may not. However, the purpose here is not to guess the title the title or artist of this piece, but instead we aim to sharpen or try to sharpen our perception skills. And so I, I invite you to take a moment to closely observe this painting and think, what do I see? What do you see? Please consider elements such as the form, colors, shapes, themes, and sensations. Think carefully about what strikes you. And on the next slide, I will reveal the full view of this artwork. What do you see? This is Pablo Picasso's Gertrude Stein, right? Now, I'll try to delve a little into the history of this painting, which is displayed nowadays on one of the walls at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. <clears throat> Leverage, leveraging recent technology that visualizes the distribution of pigments within the Picasso's painting process, uh, uh, within the layers of paint, sorry, some of the museum's researchers were able to gain deeper insights into Picasso's painting process using Gertrude Stein as his model. On this slide, you find a photograph of the actual, quote unquote, actual Gertrude Stein, right? Uh, this, this photograph was taken by Alvin Coburn in 1913 as well as some, some details from two x-rays of Gertrude Stein's face in Picasso's painting. Here you have the details, right? Of the x-rays. And one of Picasso's self-portraits. 
here. By examining the brown ochre pigment distribution map from the X-rays, we can discern the outline of an early, earlier profile in the portrait here and here. This outline suggests, suggests that Picasso not only altered the direction of the face, the final version shows the character gazing more directly ahead rather than to the side, but also introduced a certain distortion to Gertrude Stein's face. The question that arises is what motivated these changes? The scene is Paris, the year is 1906. Gertrude Stein, an American poet and essayist, and her brother Liu emerge as prominent figures in the world of modern art, becoming influential collectors and patrons in Europe. Their, their renowned salons played host to luminaries from the world of modernist art, including Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse. Debates ran rampant about who should be crowned the king of contemporary peer artists. It was during this period that Picasso, while working on Gertrude Stein's portrait, conceived an idea that would go on to revolutionize modern art. In the spring of 1907, Picasso visited an exhibition of African art at the Ethnographic Museum of Trocadero in Paris, uh, now known as the Musée de l'Homme. And by this time, at the age of 26, Picasso was already a successful artist with works from his Blue Period and Rose Period. His success was in part due to the support of his friends Gertrude and Leo Stein. During this period, Vauvism, an avant-garde art movement characterized by unconventionally uh, vivid and vibrant colors and bold brush strokes, were, was gaining prominence. Matisse, the leader of this group, was also considered the leader of the Parisian art scene. Picasso and Matisse developed both an intense rivalry and a close friendship. It was this rivalry that compelled Picasso to seek out new ways to surpass Matisse as the king of Parisian avant-garde. Interestingly, it was Matisse who initially introduced Picasso to African art. To his biographers and friends, Matisse recounted a story about his uh, autumn 1906 purchase of a Vili figu figurine from the Democratic Republic of Congo, this figure that you see over there, and the introduction of this piece to Picasso uh, by him. He acquired the figurine from Emily Heinemann, a seller of, quote, curiosities and weapons of savages, end of quote. One of Gertrude Stein, in one of Gertrude Stein's weekly gatherings, Matisse shared his newly acquired piece with Picasso, the first time Picasso had ever seen such a piece. Matisse note, noted that Picasso was very impressed by the sculpture and mentioned, we talked a long time about it and this was the beginning of our interest in African art, interest which have uh, more or less reflected in our paintings, end of quote. Gertrude Stein later wrote about this introduction in her book, The Autobiography of Alice Topas, um, 1913. And we have also a, a quick report from the artist Max, Max Jacob uh, that I can read from the, the slide. Matisse took a wooden statuette off a table and showed it to Picasso. Picasso held it in his hands all evening. The next morning, when I came to his studio, the floor was strewn with sheets of drawing paper. Each sheet had virtually the same drawing on it, a big woman's face with a single eye, a nose too long that merged into a mouth, a lock of hair on one shoulder. Cubism was born. 
uh, Picasso not only found the sculpture impressive, but also aided uh, it also aided him in resolving a dilemma he had encountered with uh, the unfinished portrait of Gertrude Stein. In 1905, Stein had posed for Picasso for a total of 90 sittings for the portrait. However, uninspired and dissatisfied with the results of his work, Picasso ultimately erased her face. It wasn't until several months later in 1907, newly inspired by the Congolese sculpture that Matisse had introduced to him, that he, re he, worked, he worked Gertrude's face without, without her presence, incorporating African mask-like features into the portrait, as we see in the final um, work of art, right? Now, if we revisit the slide we viewed late, earlier, we can observe that Picasso effectively transformed Gertrude Stein's face by incorporating the mask-like features uh, into it, essentially creating his own interpretation of Gertrude Stein. This transformative process extended beyond this portrait, also appearing in his subsequent self-portraits, including the one displayed here, as well in his masterpiece, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is current, currently on exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. It was within this context that Cubism, the artistic movement, took its roots. Despite the significance of the art, artwork we've been discussing, Gertrude Stein's portrait, it's worth noting that this intriguing, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, sorry, it's worth noting this intriguing historical uh, tidbit. History tells that Gertrude Stein always despised her portrait by Picasso, as she be believed it did not capture her true likeness. And this is a picture of the portrait and Gertrude Stein, right? Well, uh, now let's attempt to unveil another level of meaning within this narrative and explore how it might relate to healthcare and medical education. This clinical case report is an, is an excerpt from a compilation of works by the renowned Roman era physician, Claudio Galeno. And let's take a look at it. I'm gonna read it very quickly. I was called to see a woman who was stated to be sleepless at night and to lie tossing about from one position into another. Finding she had no fever, I made a detailed inquiry into everything that had happened to her, especially considering such factors as we know to cause insomnia. But she either answered little or nothing at all, as if to show that it was useless to question her. Finally, she turned away, hiding herself completely by throwing the bed clothes over her whole body and laying her head on another small pillow as if desiring sleep. After leaving, I came to the conclusion that she was suffering from one of two things, either for, from a melancholy dependent or black bile, or else trouble about something she was unwilling to confess. I therefore deferred till the next day a closer investigation of this. In this clinical case report, what Galenas is essentially doing is constructing a narrative and a character. In other words, portraying the patient. What I'm trying to convey here, drawing a connection between the reading of this clinical report and Picasso's work on his portrayal of Gertrude Stein, is that there's always an element of fiction when doctors and other healthcare professionals assess and portray their pa patients. And this doesn't imply, absolutely not, that they are intentionally deceiving or lying. 
to gain a deeper understanding of the kind of truth that can be revealed th through fiction and imagination, I will draw on the works of two of the most influential philosophers of our time. The first of these philosophers is Paul, Paul Hickel, with a particular focus on his books, The Rule on Metaphor, first published in 1975, and Time and Narrative, released in 1983. From the first book, we learn, as per recur, recur, that metaphors, metaphor or the creative image, serves as a referential purpose. In Hickel's words, being good at making metaphors, as Aristotle would say, is equivalent to being perceptive of resemblances. According to Hickel, this suggests that there is a kind of truth revealed through figuration in language brought about by the power of what he terms, and I quote, impertinent attribution. This concept involves a shift in meaning through the association of two seemingly unrelated elements leading to what he calls, and I quote, semantic innovation. For example, nature is a temple, or in our case here, Gertrude Stein is an African mask. In Time and Narrative, Hickel expands this concept of metaphorical reference to narratives as he explains further, and I will read from the slide. I see in the plots we invent the privileged means by which we reconfigure our confused, unformed, and at the limit, mute temporal experience. What then is time? asks Augustine. I know well and I know well enough what it is, provided that nobody asks me, but if I am asked what it is and try to explain, I'm baffled. In the capacity of poetic composition to refigure this temporal experience, which is prey to the aporias of philosophical speculation, resides the referential, a referential function of the plot. But what, what kind of truth it, uh, is it that can only be brought, brought forth by figuration, metaphor, imagination, and characterization? Certainly it's not the truth of veritas, the empirical truth that directed, directly links language to what we commonly call reality. This kind of truth is not revealed directly. Instead, it's glimpsed through the small door crack opened by figurative language. This is the truth of beings, an existential truth. As Heidegger puts it, truth is the unconcealedness of beings as beings. Truth is the truth of being. Beauty does not occur next to this truth. When truth sets itself into the work, beauty appears. The shining of appearance is, as this being of truth and the work, and as work, the shining of beauty. Now, I'd like to explore the artistic process of character creation, particularly the aspect of portraying. In 2022, I conducted interviews with five accomplished Brazilian writers to gain insight into their methods for developing characters. These writers included the celebrated André do Fuego and Paula Fabrio, as well as noteworthy ones such as Carlos Eduardo Pompilho and Helio Plaplet, who were both physicians. When I ask these writers about their methods for creating fictional characters, their responses were as follows. From Andrea del Fuego, it's something very intimate about identity, very intimate. I'm not sure if intimate and identity are the same thing. From Paula Fabio, how do I build characters? I observe, I try to observe without judging. From Elio Plaplet, 
To create a character, one must step into their shoes. I often say that when developing a character within a story, you have to ask yourself, what would I do in this situation? From Carlos Eduardo Pompilio, characters are archetypal representations of human beings, each placed in their own unique context, which itself carries significant weight, conveying the concept of human totality. This concept holds great value for me because it's something that science can never fully grasp. Hence, it appears that the existential and concrete significance of the characters discussed by the interviewed writers is linked to several key factors. First, the perception that they would somehow configure another version of the creator. Second, the conviction that despite being fictional beings, characters would correspond to a certain condensed, aggreg aggregated, and or and intensified aspects of the human experience through language. And third, the best crafted characters would function, function as models, which created from an identity with the self that creates them and from the observation of the world would constitute something strange, different, separated from them, a radical alterity. Uh, apologies, Fabiana, just giving you a five minute notice. Thank you. Great, I'm almost finished, thank you. In light of these consider the, the considerations presented today here and uh, how, how, how healthcare professionals engage with their patients, two significant questions come to the fore. First, the first question is, what do I do when I face a patient? With this question, I aim to explore the idea that when approaching a patient, I'm not immediately assessing the real, complete truth of their existence through science, which is to say, through, through referential language, the language of science. Instead, we must increasingly recognize that we are, in fact, building a character of the patient. This transformation of the pair of the patient into a character, it, this is important to say, does not imply that we are fabricating falsehoods. This distinction, distinction is crucial to cl clarify here. The second question is, can a more comprehensive training in the arts, such as creative writing, drawing, painting, sculpting, help me reveal the profound truths of my patients and their illnesses? I believe this approach offers a significant alternative to the current practices and teachings of narrative medicine, medical humanities, and even art therapy. It suggests different methodological approaches that not only encompass the hermeneutics of healthcare practices, but primarily embrace a creative and I dare say artistic approach. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. Uh, a number of many interesting and profound insights to draw upon. I was wondering whether you could assist me maybe to draw a, a parallel that I seem to observe here. So I go back to the observation that you made about the quote from Paula Fabrio, how do mm -hmm. I build characters? Mm -hmm. I observe, I try to observe without judging. Mm -hmm. In a sense, though, one can argue that Maybe that's not what Picasso was doing with uh, Gertrude Stein's portrait, if he had so much, in a sense, hesitation going mm -hmm. over and over uh, the, the face and, in a sense, never being satisfied by it. Then he was inspired by Congolese uh, facial art. And, in a sense, could it be said, therefore, that Picasso was not, uh, was only observing Gertrude Stein, he was not judging her, but given the many re repetitions and attempts at drawing her face, maybe he was judging himself. Mm -hmm. So is there is there any 
and it's trying to uh, uh, a kind of parallel between uh, the observation from Fabrio. Mm -hmm. I try to observe without judging. And is that, in fact, very telling about uh, Picasso's process in drawing up the portrait of Gertrude Stein? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, 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 the best way to answer to this um, question, and thank you for that, uh, is that we are always making fictions because everything we um, observe, I can say, when we express that, when we create from that, when you reimagine the things that we are seeing, we are doing this through language. And from the, what we call real world or real perception, there's always one or two levels apart because we are recreating this world through language. This is important. I would say it is important to observe without judging. Indeed. Right. And with that, uh, I'm afraid looking at the time, I think that, so thank you again, Fabiana. Thank and, you very uh, much. We uh, shift now our focus to the last talk from Bailey Carruthers from George Washington University. And uh, from uh, what I see in the abstract, uh, we're going to be taken along a journey in the footsteps of uh, Dr. Luther Brady uh, as we look at art and medicine, a discussion of visual literacy and analysis in the 20th century. Uh, Bailey, can you hear us? Oh, there, there was a, on Zoom somebody also Carruthers. So, so very supportive mother. Oh, thank you, supportive mother. Uh, so here is here is Bailey. Apologies for that. That's okay. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Bailey Carruthers, and I am a second-year master's candidate in the Museum Studies Department at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I am very excited to present my research to you all today, and I wanted to say a special thank you to Professor B.B. Obler and Olivia Kohler-Maga for assisting me with my work and encouraging me to be here today. I'm going to be discussing the history of visual literacy and visual analysis in the fields of art and medicine and the use of color employed by both to assist in the art of looking. This research was inspired by the life of Dr. Luther Brady, and I will be detailing more on his life, the power of both skills in their respective fields and how they are used to both the benefit of artists and medical professionals. So let's learn a little bit more about Dr. Brady. He was born in 1926 in Wilson, North Carolina, and in the fall of 1942 became a student at George Washington University. Noting himself as a wet behind the ears 16 year old from the South, Brady would go on to become a triple alumnus of the university earning his Associate of Arts degree in 1944, his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1946, and finishing with his medical degree in 1948. With the onset of the Korean War, Brady decided to enlist in the Navy. And when he discovered that he would be sent overseas to Japan, his close friends encouraged him to learn about Asian art. So while still in Washington, DC, awaiting to deploy to California to join the naval ship that would later bring him to Japan, he began taking personal art tutorials at the Freer Gallery of Art within the Smithsonian Institution, home to one of the most premier collections of Asian art in the country. After arriving in California in June 1953, while at a dinner party with a longtime friend in San Francisco, Brady found himself surrounded by artists who were teaching at the California School of Fine Art, now known as the San Francisco Art Institute. Brady was introduced to artists such as Richard Diebenkorn, Sonia Getchoff, Nathan Oliveira, William T. Wiley, and Ralph Ducasse, and immediately became interested in their work. Before leaving for Japan, Brady took the opportunity to visit the personal studios of his newfound connections, crediting these specific visits at the beginning of his life as a collector. In an interview decades later, Brady stated that these studio visits were the moments that he, quote, caught the bug, and once it bites, you cannot stop it. 
Following his time stationed on a cruiser operating out of Japan, Brady returned to the United States with some of the first works he ever acquired for his personal collection. His pre-service dinner function that introduced him to Bay Area artists would be an important milestone in his life that would ultimately affect his collecting style with all of the artists he met that fateful e evening being present in his collection. Over time, Brady's collection would grow with a focus on the color field artists in the New York school, but also included work by German, French, and English artists. As time went on, Brady came to be a unique collector due to his purpose, but also the relationship that he would form with the artists. Following his service, Dr. Brady began his professional career in the medical field. He completed his residencies at Jefferson Medical College and in June 1955, left to join the training program for radiation oncology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Four years later, he accepted a position as the Chief of Radiation Oncology at Hanneman Medical College and Hospital in Philadelphia, and he would stay there until 1996. He would serve as a professor beginning in 1963 and was ultimately appointed Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology and Nuclear Medicine in 1970. Following his departure from Hahnemann, Dr. Brady founded Philadelphia CyberKnife, a center featuring the first linear accelerator with a robotic arm for performing precise radiation treatment, with the success of the center leading to the creation of others across the country. Now, two skills that Dr. Brady employed on a daily basis in both his professional and personal life were that of visual analysis and visual literacy. Although the two aspects often work together to provide meaning and interpretation, they are individual skills that must be mastered by people in both the fields of art and medicine. Visual analysis most commonly refers to the ability of an individual to examine a piece of visual media and dissect single parts of or sections of the image to isolate certain ideas. Although literacy refers to letters, visual literacy is defined as the ability to interpret, evaluate, and make meaning from the information that was presented in a visual manner, such as images, drawings, renderings, paintings, and other pieces of that visual media. In short, visual analysis is the ability to examine individual aspects of a piece of visual media, while visual literacy is having the skill to understand it. When working together, visual analysis and visual literacy allow for the interpretation and understanding of complex information through visual cues, patterns, and relationships, often negating words, but still allowing for different viewers to come to the same interpretations. In the medical field, visual analysis is used on a daily basis by medical professionals to diagnose patients, examine what is happening to the body, and draw conclusions on treatment. For example, a brain tumor that can only be detected by a CT and MRI will often appear as a white colored shape within the brain. And with the use of visual analysis, doctors are able to note the foreign shape appearing on the scan that would otherwise be undetectable to the naked eye. Because of their visual literacy, medical professionals are able to draw conclusions from medical imaging, allowing for more accurate diagnosis and tailored treatment. Visual analysis of art is just as complex as the artist is trying to convey a thought, emotion, idea, or theme to the viewer, most commonly without using words. The message has to transcend time, place, and individual and be recognizable for a large community. To assist with this, many analyzing art will choose to focus on element, elements such as those listed here to understand the artist better. The purpose of visual analysis is to recognize and understand the choices that the artist made in completing the artwork. And by observing and writing about separate parts of the art, you will come to a better understanding of the object as a whole. So the employment of color is one of the most widely used and easily identifiable ways to depict meaning in both fields of art and medicine. Color has the ability to convey certain emotions, feelings, and themes to medical professionals, patients, and art viewers through similar means. For example, in 1990, the medical field introduced a procedure known as functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, that allowed researchers to conduct more elaborate scans of the human brain. 
And when the fMRI began to be widely used, the computers that conducted the scans employed color absorption data, with each color being coded to represent specific responses in the brain. These had to be inputted by a medical professional and, fo and followed society's correlation for specific colors to different emotions, feelings, and activity in the 20th century. And the levels of activity on a color-coded brain map are most commonly represented by using red as an indicator for more active brain areas and blue indicating less active brain areas. The colors that were assigned to different levels of brain activity were to help both doctors and patients to understand the activity of the human brain and when accompanied by visual literacy and visual analysis assist in the medical field. Color application in the medical field is almost always intentional and goes beyond the use of it in just medical imaging and scans with specific colors being chosen for the environment as well. For example, medical professionals, surgeons, and operating rooms are often outfitted with shades of blue and sometimes green for their uniforms, instrument tables, and operating tables, and that is deliberate due to opponent process theory. So the theory suggests that the ability to perceive color is controlled by three receptor complexes with opposing actions in everyone's brains. These three receptor complexes are the red-green complex, the blue-yellow complex, and the black and white complex. The mind can only register the presence of one color of a pair at a time because the two colors oppose one another on a color wheel. When surgeons are operating on the body, they are focusing on various shades of reds and pink, and after a long duration, can blend together, making it difficult to see subtle distinctions. However, this is a relatively new application as surgeons began donning the color blue in the early 20th century to create a better environment for surgery. Before that, during medicine's germ theory era, they wore white to associate themselves for their patients with purity and cleanliness. However, physicians noticed that this color caused vision issues and headaches, kind of like if you were to take a picture with flash and you get those little bubbles throughout. So the deliberate application of the shades of blue and green in American operating rooms helps surgeons and doctors combat eyesight fatigue when focusing for long periods of time on the red and pink hues of the body, ultimately reducing the chance of error. Similar to medical professionals, artists of the 20th century have also correlated specific emotions to different colors to convey meaning in a very deliberate way. Warm colors, such as red and orange, are believed to be stimulating, activating, and exciting to the mind. Blue, however, is often believed to have the opposite effect, as cool tone colors are related to calmness and are often associated with tranquility and peace. The use of color by artists is almost always intentional to convey theme, meaning, or emotion to the viewer without words that, again, has to transcend time and place. Although not all works of art follow this relationship between specific colors and emotions, the intentional use of them, whether following or breaking these rules, shows the intent of the artist to convey a specific theme. For example, an artist a part of Dr. Brady's personal collection, Donald Sultan, uses colors deliberately to convey theme. Sultan is an eminent, art, eminent artist who began creating during the new image art movement that rose to prominence in New York during the 1970s. The period is loosely defined as a painting movement in which artists depict everyday objects and natural forms in a minimalist state, often disassociated from their backgrounds or originally intended environments. Sultan is perhaps best known for his multiple series of works and renderings of poppy flowers, which can be seen here. And when examining three of Sultan's works, Three Poppies Gold, Flocked Flowers, and Red Poppies, September 7th, 2022, the same shapes are repeated in a similar composition. The only difference, however, is Sultan's use of color in the poppies in the background, which can convey different feelings to those viewing it. Not on view here, but a part of Dr. Brady's personal collection was something called Projection, De Projection Gel by Donald Sultan. Um, and what we can discern is that he would place it or overlay it over a projector and then would repeat the same poppy shapes as seen here, but in different colors. Dr. Brady collected many of Sultan's works, specifically ones that break down forms into their national, natural shape, structure, and composition, rendering them in a minimalistic fashion. 
There are other works in Brady's collections, which I'll talk about shortly, of the same nature, encouraging those who view it in his home to use visual analysis to feel certain emotions or themes in their bare form. Color psychology and art, similarly to medicine, is deliberate whether through the purposeful addition or subconscious omission of color by the artist. And it can impact tone, emotion, and scope of the viewer, whether they are art professionals, art lovers, or simply someone taking time to visit a new museum or gallery. Color psychology is defined as the study of shades as a determinant of human behavior. An artist take into consideration how the combination of colors in an artwork will make their viewer feel. The intentional inclusion or omission, again, of certain colors along with their application can affect the tone and emotion of the art. The two most dramatic colors that are utilized to create tone, especially when placed together, are black and white. And for example, when examining the Night Watch by Rembrandt found in the bottom left corner, the dark washes of black at the top of the painting create a sense of mystery that is cast over the subjects in the foreground. And it is difficult for the viewer to discern what is in the back and where the men are either coming from or going to. Black isn't visible. Uh, it's not a visible spectrum of color. All other colors are reflections of light except black. It is the absence of it. And unlike white and other hues, pure black can exist in nature without any light at all. White, on the other hand, comprises of all hues of visible light on the spectrum. And when looking at Guernica, the Picasso painting found in the bottom right, the white highlights the dark and ominous message of the destruction that occurred in the Basque country that this is related to. It represents death and mourning, especially when placed with the black objects in the rest of the painting. I implore you to think of just how different the night watch would feel if the background was a blue sky or a beautiful sunset and how Guernica would present itself if painted with broad swatches of bold colors instead of black and white. Now it's no secret that medicine and art are not strangers to one another and in fact find themselves combined throughout history in order to assist in visual analysis they are trying to convey individually. Um, for example, take Rembrandt's 1632 painting titled The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. It is regarded as one of Rembrandt's early masterpieces and presents an actual historical event. The painting shows Professor Tulp as he probes the anatomy of a cadaver's left arm with an instrument in his right hand, while with his own left hand demonstrates the movement of which the left hand is capable and illustrates their dependence on that anatomy. It depicts the ominous relationship between life and death as the onlookers to the autopsy hover closely over the deceased man, yet not all of them are focused on the cadaver itself. Of the seven other men in the painting, three are looking away from the procedure, while the other four are focused, some on the incisions into the body, while others look past the demonstration to a book that rests open um, on a stand beside the body. Using this book partnered with the cadaver, the doctor is providing a medical lesson with real life application, showing the medical beliefs and practices of the time. When looking through an art perspective, the color of the background, composition of the subject, light sources and shading can convey an ominous and dark feeling to the viewer based solely on art decisions by Rembrandt. This painting, when examined as both a painting and a medical depiction, is the perfect example of the intimate relationship between art and medicine. The portrait of Dr. Samuel D. Gross, also known as the Gross Clinic, also showcases another true medical event, however, now depicting American medicine techniques of the 19th century, painted by Thomas Eakins in 1875. So at the time, the rather young and little known Eakins created it specifically for Philadelphia's 1876 Centennial Exhibition, intending to showcase his talents as an artist and to honor the scientific achievements of his native state. Choosing the city's world famous surgeon and teacher, Dr. Samuel Gross as his subject, Eakins sets the scene in Jefferson Medical College's surgical amphitheater, where coincidentally, Dr. Brady would study and work just over a hundred years later. Dr. Gross is shown leading a clinic of five doctors operating on the left thigh of a patient. At the same time, Gross is demonstrating to students the relatively new surgical procedures he had developed to treat bone infections. 
In contrast to the recoiling woman and woman in the bottom left, traditionally identified as the patient's mother, Gross embodies the confidence that comes from knowledge and experience. Casting himself as a witness, Eakins can be seen seated at the upper left of the painting behind Dr. Gross. And unfortunately, Eakins' plan to accurately depict Dr. Gross in the medical process of the time failed when the art jury that he uh, submitted this to rejected it for its display in the Philadelphia Art Building. Perhaps deeming the subject too bloody and brutal, the subject shocked viewers unused to seeing such a frightening event depicted in such realistic detail as bright red blood colors the surgeon's fingers and scalpel, and the gaping incision is fascinating, repulsive, and confusing because it is so hard to read the position of the patient's body. Although some viewers admired Eakin's command of composition, color, and detail, and praised his convincing creation of form and space, many were repelled by what was considered ugly and inartistic realism. The Gross Clinic historically is no stranger to scrutiny, but it is now regarded as one of the greatest American paintings ever made and has an important place documenting the history of medicine because it honors the emergence of surgery as a healing profession and showcases how real-time medical operations were used to educate future professionals in the field at the time. Other examples of the convergence of art and medicine can be seen here through historic renderings that were created by artists to be used in medical practice. On the left is a lithographic impression of the anatomy of the bones and muscles from 1825. This impression was designed specifically for the use of artists and members of the Artist Anatomical Society so that both artists of the time and medical professionals can depict and operate on the body with the most current ideology of how the body functions. On the right is an artist colored stipple engraving of a young woman of v Vienna who died of cholera, depicted when healthy and four hours before death. This was created in the 1800s by an artist to be used by medical professionals treating individuals for symptoms of cholera. And although we now know and associate medical imagery with photographs and scans and art with more contemporary ideas and natural shapes, the art world and medical field have coexisted for hundreds of years. And while we both use visual culture separately in the fields, they do come together to benefit one another. As written by Stephen Hirschauer, an academic in sociological theory and gender studies, quote, much effort has gone into making images look like the body and the body like the image, and that these mutually produce ways of seeing for both doctors and artists. The medical field and the art world were both established on the basis of drawing conclusions and meetings from items without words. And when working together, the similarities of both fields are easily recognizable as they both rely on color and visual culture to convey theme and meaning. There are often more similarities and differences between medicine and art and learning one another can provide both fields with the ability to innovate, especially when it comes to visual analysis and visual literacy. As we move farther and medical technology becomes more advanced, the medical field will still require visual culture to examine and interpret and make conclusions about what is being presented, especially in areas of the body that are not visible to the naked eye. And as art continues to shift into new movements, particularly towards more contemporary shapes, we welcome a new way of viewing as visual culture will be as important as ever as it's as it is up to the artist to decide how they will have to convey their message to the viewer and it's up to the audience to have the ability and skills to decipher the theme emotion and message before his death in 2018 dr brady devoted his life not only to medicine but also to his personal interest in the arts that had been established decades prior at that san francisco dinner party he is a perfect example of the convergence of art and medicine, and his legacy today continues his passion. The George Washington University, in honoring his work, has devoted an exhibition space known as the Luther W. Brady Gallery in their Corcoran School of Art and Design with a mission to collect, preserve, and exhibit the George Washington University's art collection and to provide opportunities for collaboration and integration of the collection with students. The Brady Estate recently bequeathed more than 130 works of art to the university, with some also going to the Reading Public Museum in Pennsylvania. 
And we have works from artists such as Ralph DeCoste, Richard Diebenkorn, Herbert Ferber, Helen Frankenthaler, Louise Nevelson, Kenzo Okada, Fritz Scholder, George Segal, Frank Stella, and countless others. The Art of Collecting, Gifts of the Luther Brady Estate Exhibit is currently on view in his namesake gallery in Washington, D.C., now until May 2024. Among the featured pieces are Howard Hodgkin's Heat, Barbara Hepworth's Autumn Day, Jules Olitsky's Pleasures Three, and Bronze Maquettes by Henry Moore. Showcasing Dr. Brady's continuing impact on GW, the exhibit will bring works by important artists in close proximity to students and classes in the Corcoran School. The artwork in the background of the photo on the left uh, with Dr. Brady in front of it is actually the work of Sam Mateen, another artist in the um, Brady collection that he extensively uh, acquired works for. Inspired by the bold colors and energetic shapes and style of his work, Dr. Brady commissioned Mateen as a part of a project to bring art and his patients together. Following his original vision, Mateen's pieces are working to be installed in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the George Washington University Hospital in the form of ceiling tiles like the one on the left to bring inspiration and entertainment to future patients. In the coming year, there will be a total of six of Mateen's works installed throughout the treatment's rooms. And again, an example of one of the tiles that is currently on display in GW's collection can be seen on the right. Dr. Brady truly devoted his life to the things that he loved, the two most prominent being that of medicine and art. He was known for creating great interpersonal relationships with both his medical clients and the artists of the work he would collect, showing his immense appreciation and understanding for both. There are often a lot of, dis there's discourse between art and medicine as two separate subjects when it comes to science and learning. However, learning from one another can provide both fields with the ability to innovate and excel, especially when it comes to visual literacy and analysis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brady. That was fascinating. I'll, I'll start by uh, asking, did the... Um... Luther Brady ever had the opportunity to comment about the rejection of Econ's Gross Clinic. Yes. I would imagine he would have said something about that. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. So um, the, the, the Brady Gallery was actually named before he passed in the early 2000s. So they've had um, shows and exhibitions where he was actually able to bring the artists in. He truly loved the Gross Clinic painting um, and he saw it as a true work of art. And he didn't really agree with, um, you know, at the time, them rejecting the piece. But it did stand in Jefferson Medical College for a very long time. And there's a reproduction there now. So he saw it on almost a daily basis. And he truly enjoyed it. Well, that, that's, an, that's an answer that's very telling about his his approach. Any questions from the floor? I, just one final comment. Yeah. Um, you know, color literacy, et cetera. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Brady, as a radiation oncologist, would know that the same treatment would not work on this, on on the same tumor in different patients, and uh, of course we know that uh, color blindness exists around eight percent level. So uh, again, did uh, Dr. Brady ever comment about you know the impact of color blindness on the appreciation of of drawings and and pictures and because ultimately it's how we, we perceive and it, we have our own limitations, as it were. Yeah, um, I don't believe that he ever commented extensively or truly about color blindness, um, but I think something that kind of speaks to how much he was a true passionate for the arts and for his patients um, can be seen here with the Mateen piece and it would actually be elevated kind of in ceiling tiles like the ones that are in this building, um, but the aggressive use of different colors, I think, even with some sort of color deficiency or color blindness could allow for the shapes for to still contrast. be made out. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, and with that, uh, I bring the session to a close. One final applause to our speakers. And with that, thank you very much. All the best. <laughs>